thanks for the opportunity to give this uh, talk. Um, my name is Dan Beard. For those who don't know me, I'm from I'm from physiology department here at uh, UMish. My talk is going to be um, about regulation of mitochondrial substrate transport and oxidation. It's going to mostly about that. Um, you know, I want to start out. There we go. Um, with kind of some more big picture stuff. Um, how is how is how is ATP synthesis controlled? Um, and oh, I want to point out. I want to encourage interruptions, questions. Um, you know, you can put a question in the chat if you want. If, if somebody sees a question pop up in the chat and I don't notice it, then, you know, please do go ahead and interrupt me. Um, okay, so this is, this is going to be the story about how mitochondria make ATP. All right, okay. Uh, they don't make ATP out of thin air, so the mitochondria make um, ATP from the products of ATP hydrolysis, right? So ATP gets hydrolyzed and it does all, you know, grabs all kinds of important things in, in the heart, which is the organ we care about. Most of the ATP hydrolysis is done by the myosin ATPase. So it has to do with, um, you know, generating work, generating mechanical power, okay? And then those, those products of the, of the um, hydrolysis are the substrates for the, for the ATP synthesis, right? Okay, and I wanna do a, a few kind of fun calculations to start out. Um, so this kind of calculation you've seen before, um, this is this is the equation for the. There, oops, I'm trying to do my. Uh, there we go. Here, this is the equation for the um, the free energy of ATP hydrolysis or the ATP hydrolysis potential, right? Um, you've seen this kind of calculation before. There's an there's there's an apparent or an effective reference Gibbs free energy. Um, and then there's this statistical term or this, this entropy term, which has to do with the log of the uh, mass action ratios of the concentrations. Um, and the ATP concentration in a cardiomyocyte, a heart muscle cell is about 10 millimolar, or in, in these are, you know, everything's here expressed in units of molar. The ADP concentration is about one one hundredth of that, or about one micromolar. Inorganic phosphate is hard to measure, but we think it's about five millimolar, uh, you know, 0.5 millimolar. And so when you do this calculation, you get about minus 63 kilojoules per mole. Okay, the minus means, um, you know, for a process, this is, oh, sorry, it's this process we're talking about, the ATP hydrolysis. So the convention is that that, that there's for the uh, a thermodynamic potential going down for a process that's driven to go in the forward direction. Okay, so minus 63 kilojoules per mole, is that a lot or is that a little? Anybody have have an idea? It's a lot. It's a lot. A lot compared to what? <laughs> so, so um, it, it it is a lot compared to a lot of reactions in the cell, right? Absolutely. Um, um, you know, KT one K or one RT or one KT you know, is on the order of two and a half kilojoules per mole. So 63 minus 63 is a lot in magnitude, a lot bigger than, than RT or, or, or uh, KT, right? Um, I like to think about this number as an energy density, right? And so we can convert um, an energy density to an energy by thinking about the mass of the, um, oh, I need to stop this thing, the mass of the, um, left ventricle. So, so an adult human left ventricle is, let's say, about 100 milliliters. Um, about 70% of that left ventricle is uh, cardiomyocytes, All right? So here's, here's what I'm doing. So there's the mass fraction that are cardiomyocytes. ATP concentration is about 10 millimolar. Um, so if we take um, liters times moles per liter, we get moles. We multiply that by kilojoules per mole, and we wind up with 44 joules. Okay, so 44 joules is, is the amount of energy in ATP hydrolysis potential in the left ventricle of an adult human heart. Um, it's not quite as if, this is really kind of back of the envelope calculation, so let's not take it too far, but, but you know, um, in reason this is, one of the reasons this, this is a back of the envelope calculation is because, because it's not as if there's 44 joules of energy stored up. As soon as you start hydrolyzing ATP, then your ATP hydrolysis potential 
magnitude is going to go down because you're going to be changing these concentrations. But you know, back of the envelope calculation, 44 joules. Okay, in the metal crater. Is that a lot? Is 44 joules a lot of energy? So to answer that question, um, let me get rid of this annotation thing. Oh, I'm gonna have to clear my, my drawings. Okay, you've seen one of these things before, right? Double uh, A battery. So, so you know, um, this is in your your um, your or your kids. Uh, Xbox game controller. You've got a couple of these things, right? So apparently a, a AA battery has about uh, 3.9 watt hours of energy. So what's a watt hour? A watt is a is a joule per second. So we can take 3.9 watt hours and we can multiply by 3,600 seconds in an hour and we get 14,000 joules, okay? So so there's a lot more energy in a AA battery than there is in an ATP in your, in your heart, like orders and orders of magnitude, right? Um, Okay, but is that actually the right comparison to make? All right, so I don't know. So let's go back to this number. So thinking about batteries, right? Um, thinking about our electrical battery, we, we, in, in, a, in a battery, we measure electrical potential in volts, right? So what's a volt? The volt is a joule per coulomb. Um, how many volts is 63 kilojoules per mole? Does anybody know? Okay. It's like, it's like, teaching class, you have to, you know, sort of have these long, uncomfortable pauses and see if anybody has an answer. Um, it's actually an easy unit conversion to do. So, so a volt is a, is a joule per coulomb. Um, we have a, um, I think you can see my mouse, we have a unit converter called Faraday's constant. Faraday's constant is, 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 is just the number of coulombs there is in a mole, about 96,000 coulombs there are in one mole. So we can, we can just do this calculation and 63 kilojoules per mole is about 650 millivolts. Okay. So again, is that a lot? Is that a little? And, and compared to what is the question? So our, our AA battery, you know, the electrical potential, um, you know, currents delivered at a, at a potential of about one and a half volts. Okay. So this is about, you know, half of that in terms of potential. 650 millivolts is a lot more than the electrical potential across most biological membranes. And as a matter of fact, we can do a little kind of fun little calculation with, with this number, 650 millivolts. And the calculation that we can do is as follows. So if the, electrical, if the electrostatic potential across the mitochondrial inner membrane is 175 millivolts, and that's a reasonable number, um, we can measure it. How many charges must be moved down the potential gradient to provide sufficient energy to synthesize one ATP? And specifically, I'm talking about synthesizing ATP at this potential. Depends on the capacitance of the inner membrane. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, uh oh. It... <laughs> uh -oh. Yeah, no, you're, you're thinking about total energy, but I'm thinking about about in a steady state. Less. Oh, so, sorry. Okay. Bit, right. So in a steady state, we're assuming that we're, we're continuing to, to, to maintain this. this um, I mean, you're right. If we, were, if we were running a time dependent system, right? How fast are we? The capacitance will tell us how fast we're, we'd be running off this energy, this 175 millivolts as we run charges across it. But I'm thinking about, okay, I'm going to, I'm, 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 I'm maintaining this 175 millivolts by some other process like the electron transport chain, for example. And then I have another process, which you probably know about, which is, which is has charges moving down the gradient of that 175 millivolts. So it's 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 a positive outside, negative inside, negative inside the matrix. These are hydrogen ions that are moving across that that um, down that gradient. And I'm synthesizing ATP at a hydrolysis potential of 650 millivolts. My driving force for that synthesis is 175 millivolts. It's actually a really simple calculation. Um, it's just um, 650 divided by 175, which is, gives me 3.7. 3.7 charges. Is that, you guys think that's, that's a reasonable answer? I know for the plasma membrane, everyone always thinks it's more charges than it really is. So <laughs> maybe. So we'll see actually that that's, that's, that's a reasonable answer. Um, how many, does anybody know about, let me just ask, does anybody know what the stoichiometry of the F1, F0 ATP is? 
that's sort of what we're getting to, to here. Okay, so hold that, hold that. Oh, there, I see something coming up in the chat. Four, so Vanny says four. Um, and that's a good that's a good guess, and it's and it in in four it, it's actually closer to three, we think it. Um, and although it depends on whether we're talking about a, a bacteria or we're talking yeah, about yeah, I was gonna say, animal. does it? Are you talking about like the the C subunits and the the protons have to move to turn the C subunits? Hold that, and we'll get to that. You're you're you're, and I'm I'm saying that because you're 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 getting me out of my comfort zone with with this. <laughs> molecular details but actually well i it, it i think the number we're going to use the number eight thirds in a little while and i think i think it's eight protons for one revolution of that of that that ring and then one revolution gives you three atps supposedly and the man and the mammalian um uh atpas so you wind up with eight thirds which is a very funny stoichiometry um, and we'll see, we'll use that number eight thirds later on. Eight thirds is less than 3.7. So that's kind of an interesting question to put in the back of your, your mind. Okay, so, so more fun calculation stuff. Okay, so, so here's another fun calculation. So the left ventricular myocardium hydrolyzes ATP at a rate of about 0.35 millimoles per second per liter. And I'm just giving you that number. We're not, we're not you know, um, calculating that. But we can measure that pretty well. One way we can measure that is by measuring oxygen consumption in the heart. And um, we, we know what the ratio between, we know what the PO ratio is. So the ratio between oxygen consumption and, and ATP synthesis. So, so this is a pretty good number representing what your heart is, how, how fast your heart is burning ATP when you're sitting in a chair or you're lying down, not when you're when you're exercising at you know, VO2 max or something like that. Okay, so let's take that, that left ventricle that's about a, you know, uh, 100 milliliters um, and we get a flux of about 0 0.035 millimoles of ATP per second. Okay, let's multiply that by 63 kilojoules per mole, that potential, right? And so, um, you know, the millis and the kilos cancel, 0 0.035 times 63 is about two or 2.2. 2. 2.2 joules per second. That's where burning energy in a form of ATP in the left ventricle, about 2.2 joules per second. Does anybody know what a joule, per, another name for a joule per second? It's, it's right here on the screen. It's a, it's a W. Um, what's a W? A what? Nobody wants to say it. Yeah, thanks. thanks. <laughs> so, it's, I think that was Les who said that. It's, it's a watt, a watt. So, you know, um, that's a nice reference kind of num um, a number to think about because you, you, you know what a watt is a little bit. Um, you know, a light bulb, an old fashioned light bulb before LED light bulbs um, might, might be burning energy at about 60 watts, right? And so your heart's burning energy at about two watts, okay? And it's doing work at about one watt, okay? So that's the mechanical power output of your left ventricle at rest is about a watt. When you're really exercising, especially if you're young and fit, um, you might be able to do, do five or more watts of, of mechanical power output um, in your heart. Um, you can't do 60, even if, you're, even if you're, you're in the Olympics. Okay, so is that a lot? Um, two watts, one watt, these are kind of interesting numbers, right? Um, this, Battery, by the way, we already said it, 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 it can deliver 3.9 watt hours, okay? So that means battery can run your heart. This, this, this one AA battery can run your heart for about four hours, right? Um, anybody know how many horsepower is in a watt? Just out of curiosity, that's another sort of measure of power that you might be familiar with is horsepower, right? You're, um, uh, a watt is you know, this is back of the envelope kind of stuff, but a watt is about one one thousandth of a horsepower. Okay, so so if your car has a hundred horsepower engine, um, that's one, your, your, your heart does one one hundred thousandth the power output of your, you know, Honda Civic or whatever. Okay, all right, any, I see something coming in on the chat. Um, where does, oh, where does the rest of it go? What a good, question you meaning okay so so this is an inefficiency i think was was the uh was what what, the, what we're asking right um 
we're, we're burning chemical energy at two watts and we're doing one watt of work, okay? That means that the, trans, the, the free energy transduction from chemical energy to mechanical power output or mechanical work is not 100% efficient. It's about, roughly speaking, 50% efficient, okay? And there are other losses, there are other inefficiencies. For example, we have to synthesize ATP, right? And there's from, you know, from oxidizing carbon substrates. And we're gonna talk about that in, 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 in a little while. And there's inefficiencies there. So the, 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 the heart and muscle in general is not a particularly inefficient, and it's not a particularly efficient system at transforming chemical energy into mechanical power. Your Honda Civic is more efficient, um, particularly if um, actually a diesel engine is, is even more efficient than a, than a gas engine typically. Um, but the but muscle is not very efficient at transforming chemical energy to, to mechanical power. Um, the overall efficiency of say oxidizing a, a glucose to do mechanical work in the myocardium is is about twenty percent or about twenty five percent something like that. So so just going from ATP to to mechanical power, the efficiency is about fifty percent. Oh, I think this may be another another chat. Ah. Okay, 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 sorry, Lydia. All right, next question, next calculation. Okay, so this is, this is kind of fun. Um, what's the free energy of ATP hydrolysis inside the mitochondrial matrix? Okay, so, so remember we have this basic equation for the ATP hydrolysis potential, right? Um, that's in the myocardium, right? Well, that, sorry, that's in the cytosol outside of the mitochondria. Inside the mitochondria, we have the opposite process happening. We have ATP synthesis happening. And so our Gibbs energy equation looks just like this one with a couple of additions. So the first thing is this term, this first term, and the second term have opposite signs. We have opposite signs because we're talking about the opposite direction reaction, right? And now we have this other term, which is this thing, okay? And Vanny, this is my my eight thirds, and this is this is the number we use in our our analyses and our in our simulations, and this eight third comes from the idea that, like I said, so it takes eight protons to rotate that that thing, and like I also like I said, I'm getting out of my comfort zone a little bit in these these um, detailed molecular mechanics, um, and then there are three subunits which synthesize ATP, so you get three ATPs for every rotation. And so on the whole, for every eight protons, single charges translocated across that matrix, we, 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 um, we generate three ATP. So you get eight thirds of an ATP um, per charge. I'm sorry, it's eight thirds of a charge per ATP, for one ATP, okay? And so this extra term says, I have a driving force for this ATP synthesis, which is this membrane potential. This F is just that unit converter, that Faraday's constant we looked at before because membrane potential we usually measure in volts, right? Joules per coulomb. F is gonna change my joules per coulomb into, um, into joules per mole, which is what we measure these references. We usually measure RT in joules per mole and we measure this reference Gibbs energy in, in, in joules per mole. Okay, and so next thing we're going to do is we're going to take this equation and say, okay, so this, by the way, so why is this negative? So, so we, our, our, our convention that we're going to use is that the membrane potential is positive when it's, when it's driving charge in, right? And so this negative means that if we have a positive membrane potential, we're going to want to drive this reaction here in the forward direction to synthesize ATP, okay? Um, and... Um, we're going to make another assumption. We're going to assume equilibrium, okay? And we're going to find out if this assumption is okay. But if we assume, assume equilibrium, then the free energy is zero, okay? And now we can do a kind of a little trick. We can do a little calculation. I'm going to, I'm going to switch the sign of this thing. I'm going to move it to this other side, but then I'm going to switch the sign of everything. So then this term here, whoops, it's going to, sorry. You know, this is going to become have a positive, this net positive is going to become a negative. And this is going to be this, this thing here, right, is this equation here. It's the free energy of ATP hydrolysis. So it turns out that the, if we assume equilibrium, the free energy of ATP hydrolysis inside the mitochondrial matrix is this. And we'll see if that's a good assumption or see if that makes sense. 
So clear my drawings. Next page, we get a free energy of ATP hydrolysis of about minus 45 kilojoules per mole. Minus 45 kilojoules per mole is not minus 62 or minus 63 or whatever he said, right? So how come? Anybody know why the, we're getting such a low magnitude of ATP hydrolysis potential inside the mitochondrial matrix? Do we think that's right? Do we think it makes sense? So another way to think about, it, actually, I'm giving you the answer. I'm, I'm, I'm here in this calculation. So, so um, remember, we said that it, we get about minus 60, 62, or I don't know, 63, whatever we, about minus 63 is what we calculated for the ATP hydrolysis potential outside the cell. So, so the magnet, so, so associated with that ATP hydrolysis potential in the, in the cytosol outside the mitochondrial matrix was this 100 to 1. ATP ADP ratio. With this much lower magnitude of ATP hydrolysis potential inside the matrix, the ATP ADP ratio is really the opposite. It's one to 20 or one to 10, um, roughly speaking, inside the matrix. Okay, so there's a lot less ATP. It's all outside the mitochondria. The ATP and ADP, the adenonucleotides are all in ATP, 90. 9% ATP, right? Inside, it's, it's the other way around. It's almost all ADP. So there's a couple, there's a related question here. How can this free energy be so different? How can the magnitude be so much lower inside than it is outside? And how could I get, if I have so much less ATP inside, how can I get the ATP out? Because ATP that I make in a matrix has to come out Try drawing with my finger, and then ADP has to come in, and so that's also moving across the concentration gradient in the wrong direction, right? So how can that happen? You have a transporter. There's a transporter, and that transporter, what it is transporting a three minus ATP for four minus a three minus ADP for four minus ATP. So that's a charge transfer. Port, right? That's effectively a negative charge out or a positive charge in. Okay. And so if we do the same kind of, and, and so that's that, that I'm answering both of these questions at the same time with, with this transporter, this transporter is electrogenic, that, that transporter is using the membrane potential. And so if we do the same kind of calculation, except instead of eight thirds, we use eight thirds plus one, 11 thirds. And 11 thirds is getting kind of close to that 3.7 number, by the way. Um, we get this, All right? So that says a couple of things. So that says, first of all, this system is, is and, that's, and that's really close to what the ATP hydrolysis potential is. And, 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 and uh, so you get this extra boost in energy from the transporter, right? Um, you're synthesizing ATP at a relatively low magnitude of ATP hydrolysis potential, and then you transport it out and you're boosting up the energy by another, um, by another 175 millivolts as a matter of fact, okay? Um, and, and you can you know, convert that to kilojoules per mole. Um, and this whole system seems like this whole system has to be operating pretty darn close to equilibrium. Um, one thing we're ignoring here is, is any contribution from um, a pH gradient to the proton motive force. And you know, that's, that's probably minor, but it's not zero. And so that's one way you could get a little bit more than, than minus 62. You might be able to get minus 63 or minus 64. Um, any of this make sense? What's 11 thirds? Anybody who has a calculator, how close is that to three sevenths? 11 thirds is, is 3.667, right? So pretty darn close. It's not magic, but it's kind of cool, right? It comes out like that, all right? So, so, um, Oh, I have a chat. Oops. Uh, stop annotating. Look at the chat. Okay. Oh, that was slick. Yeah, isn't this kind of slick? It's kind of fun. Um, we. Um, Why is the contribution of pH negligible here when you're extruding protons and making the environment more acidic in the intermembrane? 
Ah, good question. So what is what do you think is the pH gradient? How much? What's the delta pH? So you know, and and it if if the delta pH were one, okay, that would be a tenfold difference in concentration. A tenfold difference in concentration. If we go back to our, um, you know, uh, this this is a good a good question, Benny, to make me do this uh, calculation. Um, let's go back here. Um, well, that's okay. Let's just look at this equation here at the top. Okay, so uh, what 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 is what is a um, a tenfold difference in concentration would give you a free energy contribution of about 2.3, which is log of 10 times KT. And does anybody know what that works out to in millivolts? If there's any electrophysiologists in the room, this should be at your fingertips, right? Um, is it um, 20 millivolts? So it's, it's, it's about 20 millivolts for a, a constant, um, it, R, RT is about 20 millivolts, exactly. Um, two point, so, so, but, but when you, when you, but, but if you have a tenfold concentration change, you wind up with log of 10 times, um, times KT, and you wind up with about 60 millivolts, right? And so the nerds potential for a tenfold difference in concentration is about 60 millivolts. If you think about, um, that's you know, concentration in, of protons, right? Right. Well, but it's concentration of anything, but we're talking specifically yeah, about yeah, yeah. Protons, right? Right, right, right. So, so um, you know, if you have like like a like a you know potassium gradient of of, of a little more than tenfold, right? Um, right? You wind up with a nurse potential of something like eighty millivolts, mm -hmm. right? And so, if you had a so so back to any specific question, if you have a pH gradient of ten, um, you know your your membrane potential might be one hundred um, and eighty, and you might get another sixty from uh, in the proton motive force, but the pH gradient isn't, isn't 10. The delta pH is really only about, maybe it's 0.1. It's hard to measure in, in vivo. Um, in vitro, we don't really see much of a pH gradient. It may be 0.1 unit or something like that. So it may be a few millivolts. It's good, it's good. These, these kind of calculations are nice to be able to do in the back of the envelope, right? You, it's, it's, if you work in mitochondria, it's really good to be able to think about these kinds of energies and, and how these energies relate to one another. Um, and, and these energies then give us information about um, mass action ratios and concentration gradients. And we can relate, and it's nice to be able to relate Gibbs energies to membrane potentials and, and on and on and on. And as a matter of fact, we, 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 we spent some time putting together this resource um, that we turned into, a, into an online publication called Quantitative Analysis of Mitochondrial Synthesis. So some of the folks down here, these are the folks that, that put this resource together and you can go to this URL. Actually, we're, we're, we, we, we're, we submitted this thing for publication and we're in the middle of a revision. Um, and so it's only going to get better, but you can get this, um, you can get this resource at this URL. And a lot of these kind of calculations are there and embedded in it and more even, and including some simple models to do some simulations and, um, and along with codes. So, so what's really cool about this is the computer codes are embedded and you can get the codes and you can run the models and you can analyze the data. So it's kind of a fun thing. Um, and the models that we put together are, you know, basically do the same kind of things as the models I'm gonna show you in the rest of this talk. The models in this, on this website are a little more simple. Simple is not better or worse. Um, it's just, you know, what it is. Um, it, depends on, it depends on the application. Um, but onto, onto um, trying to simulate mitochondrial function. Okay, so, so how can we assess how, how ATP synthesis is controlled, right? And so you can take mitochondria out of a tissue. And um, in this case, these are experiments taking mitochondria out from guinea pig liver. And, um, and then assessing respiratory control. And so what that means is, and these experiments are from 1955, by the way, from uh, Britain Chance. Okay, and so what we're looking at are plots of ox rate of oxygen consumption at titrating in different amounts of ADP. And what they did is they said, look, if you, you can make a, a kind of simple kind of 
saturating Michaelis Menten like relationship between rate of oxygen consumption, which is proportional to the rate of ATP synthesis, and the initial amount of ADP that is added, and they get an apparent KM of about 20 micromoles. Okay, and so that's that's a model. It, the model says that as ADP concentration goes up, respiration goes up, um, and it's a michaelis menten kind of process with a, with a KM, and the KM is like 20 micromoles. Okay, 19, you know, fast forward, um, 1986, um, what, um, this is the same group, Britain Chance's group, right? And, and so what this group was doing is making measurements of phosphate metabolites in vivo in human muscle. And in particular, they're putting them, putting their arm in a magnet and they were doing a squeezing a, like a forearm flexor exercise. Um, and they made a prediction and that is that there's a relationship between the work that's done and um, the ADP. And so down here, um, this is that model that they got from guinea pig, isolated guinea pig liver uh, mitochondria. This S is, is ADP. ADP concentrations are too small to measure in the magnet, but what they did is they found out empirically that there's this relationship between phosphocreatine, inorganic phosphate, which can be measured in, in skeletal muscle, and, um, and the ADP concentration. So this relationship here translates to this relationship here, and it fits the data really well. Okay, so, so in other words, What's happening? So, 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 guinea pig, um, liver, mitochondria tell us exactly how respiratory um, control works in uh, vivo in human muscle. So that's kind of interesting. Um, let me get rid of those drawings. Okay. Whoops. I have a blue dot on the screen, which is not going to go. Ahead. Okay. So then, and you can make the models a little more complicated. So it turns out that um, you know this is this is a uh, a paper from, from 2000 from Marty Kuzmerich and, and, and Paolo Vicini. And um, in this experiment, they, they didn't do exercise, but they occluded blood flow to the muscle. And so they're looking at really resting state kind of um, energetics. And then, in the, and then they, they can get ATP hydrolysis rate by looking at the decline of, of inorganic phosphate. And they can get the, 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 the ATP resynthesis rate by looking at the recovery of creatine phosphate once they release the occlusion. It turns out at really low levels of exercise, they have to use a Hill coefficient. So this is like, you know, in, the, in, the, in a chance model, this Hill coefficient is one, but it's the same kind of model of respiratory control. It's a Dutch group um, who did the same kind of experiments. And, and again, they had to use, they had to have this Hill coefficient and this kind of offset. And so if you look at this, this simple michaelis menten model, when you go down to zero ADP, you have zero oxygen flux, but there's like an offset here. The ADP doesn't quite go to zero at zero, right? Um, in, in muscle. And um, so there's this kind of not quite perfect michaelis menten kind, kind of thing happening um, in skeletal muscle. Okay, so what about the heart? So in the heart, um, Around the same time as that 1985 chance study in 1986, Balaban published these uh, measurements. Um, and this is here on the left is a plot of creative phosphate to ATP ratio at different myocardial work rates. Um, and, and this experiment was, was kind of a big deal because um, you know, it's one thing to do this, these kind of measurements in your arm that's relatively still, but the heart is moving, right? Um, and it's a relatively thin wall that's moving inside the chest. So, you know, how do you get a surface coil on it? How do you account for motion artifacts? So this groundbreaking experiment and the conclusion of the experiment was that, um, you know, ADP concentrations don't change. Okay, so it's, it's the opposite of what's happening in skeletal muscle, right? Um, and a follow-up study a couple of years later, so on the right, they reported measurements of inorganic phosphate also. And the conclusion was that a, the feedback control model of ADP and PI cannot explain the regulation of um, oxidative respiration by of ATP synthesis in the myocardium. Okay. Um, so that's the total opposite of skeletal muscle, right? Um, so what was happening in vitro perfectly explains what was happening in the muscle. Okay. Um, and particularly when the muscle is working, um, and the heart's always working, okay? Um, and so that means that ATP synthesis is regulated in cardiac muscle mitochondria in a way that's fundamentally different than it is in skeletal muscle mitochondria. So that's kind of a big deal. Um, and it turns out that this idea is completely wrong, okay? And so, so here's, um, on the right are some measurements done a, a decade later. Um, and, you know, 
it, it turns out that inorganic phosphate levels are not detectable at baseline, but only when you start to exercise can you then see inorganic phosphates start to appear in the spectra. And this is, in, this is not really quantitative, it's inorganic phosphate change from baseline relative, measured relative to phosphocreatine. And so we went back and we said, okay, let's do this same kind of thing that was done in 1955, let's do it in 2016. Um, we can do it a little bit better. Um, and, 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 and instead of looking at initial rates and this kind of respirometry experiment, what we did is we titrated in enzymes that hydrolyze ATP. So this is an isolated mitochondria experiment. It's in mitochondria from heart, from rat heart, actually. And when we titrated in different amounts of eight, different levels of ATP hydrolyzing mitochondria, uh, ATP hydrolyzing enzymes, we get different steady state oxygen consumptions at different phosphate levels. And we can also measure ADP. Um, in, in this system. And we can measure with TPP system, I don't wanna go through the details, but we can also measure membrane potential, we can measure NADH, and we can measure in kind of a, 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 um, a custom system, we can measure cytochrome C absorbance, which gives us the redox state of cytochrome C. And so in these quasi-steady experiments, we could put together these relationships between um, the rate of oxygen consumption and the ADP and the inorganic phosphate. And so here, this is like that, the chance model, right? Um, as ADP goes up, respiration rate goes up. So this is respiratory control. And it doesn't, and, 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 and there's a dependency, not just on ADP, but also on inorganic phosphate. So these, this is a model put together by Jason Basil. The model, that Basil's model is capturing in this picture, the, the stuff that's highlighted here in this, in this sort of, um, light blue, the oxidative phosphorylation, not all these other, other things. Um, but because we can actually measure some of these state variables associated with, with the respiratory chain, like NADH, cytochrome C, membrane potential, right, and ADP and inorganic phosphate, we, we have a lot more state variables and we can put together a model to simulate what's going on. Um, so compare this model to this model, basically same kind of idea at, at, the end, at, the, at the end of the day, just a lot more, a lot more complicated. Um, okay, so then Fan Wu um, in the lab uh, was using these kind of models to actually simulate the in vivo energetics based on data, which came mostly from the Minnesota group, um, Jay Zhang, Bob Baki, Camille Lurgerbill. And it turns out that when we take those kind of relationships that we measure in, um, in mitochondria in vitro, we can match the relationships that are observed in vivo between creatine phosphate, inorganic phosphate. So these are steady state relationships in the, these two plots on the right, uh, on the left. And on the right, this is a transient experiment where um, uh, we didn't do this experiment. Jay Zhang did this experiment where he occluded the LAD in the myocardium, creatine phosphate goes down, inorganic phosphate starts to become visible and goes up. You release the occlusion, you get this recovery, you get this recovery. And so the, the model, which comes completely from um, in vitro experiments explains what's happening in vivo. And um, it's, it's the, the model works in the, in the opposite it, it, it way of, of, of the conclusions that were drawn from those early experiments by Balaban. Okay, and then, whoops. And then just very briefly, we can also simulate and, and match what's happening in humans, okay? And what's happening in heart failure uh, using measurements that come from um, the myocardium of the animal models and sometimes from human subjects on um, how, how metabolite pools change in heart failure. Um, so that's not what this talk is about. Um, the big picture here is that, um, you know, this was, this was the model from 1955, which was a pretty good model and it worked um, for skeletal muscle. Um, in our, our measurements, the KM or the K, uh, parent KM for ADP was about 30 micromolar, not 20. Um, the KM for inorganic phosphate is about a millimolar, okay? So we don't really need a complicated model. We can build a, a really simple sort of relationship with a parent, two apparent KMs instead of just one. And it turns out we can match cardiac energetics really, really well. Um, this statement here, this conclusion from um, 1986, that um, an isolated mitochondria flux is controlled by ADP alone and ADP does not change over, over the observed range of rate pressure products. So that's kind of a straw man because um, the flux is not controlled by ADP alone in isolated mitochondria. Um, it's controlled by ADP alone as long as the, as long as the ADP is the limiting concentration. Um, but it's when phosphate is a limiting concentration, it's controlled by phosphate. And so um, here's the sort of overall story. In skeletal muscle, inorganic phosphate is really high. 
Um, skeletal muscle comes in a lot of different kinds of fiber types. Um, resting inorganic phosphate is at least two millimolar, maybe five or more. Um, and ADP is really low. Um, and so phosphate is saturating and the controls by ADP. In the myocardium, the, the phosphate, as best as we can estimate it, it's hard to measure, um, is lower than a millimolar. And, and this 0.25 number that we estimate is corresponds to a large mammal in, a, in an anesthetized condition, um, you know, where the heart's really not working hard at all, probably closer to about a half a millimolar, we think at rest in, in a human myocardium, but ADP is much higher. So phosphate is, is a limiting variable. So this, you know, as long as ADP is much higher than the KM, you know, it doesn't, you know, it's not, it's not really contributing anything to the respiratory control. Okay. So, hey, so that's, Ryan. yeah, go ahead. Coast, it's got a question for you. If you go back one slide, yep. What is the what is the physiological significance of having uh, the ADP and the uh, phosphate at such different concentrations between these two muscle types, and yeah. how is that regulated? Yeah. Okay. So I, I don't really know the answer to either one of those questions, but we sort of ask those questions. So the regulation is a really interesting question that we'd we'd like to be able to answer. Um, the physiological significance, and by the way, we think the mitochondria are roughly doing the same thing. If I take my myocardium at these levels and I dump in a whole bunch of phosphate, right? What's going to happen is you're going to have phosphate available to, to, to phosphorylate ATP. Your ADP concentration is going to go down. Your free phosphate is going to go up and the myocardium is going to look like skeletal muscle. Okay. What that will do, we think, so this is sort of an answer to your first question is it's gonna really slow down fractional shortening in the myocardium and it's gonna cause heart failure. So the cross bridge in the myocardium during the cardiac cycle doesn't really work well at these kind of skeletal muscle concentrations. So, um, and, and as a matter of fact, during heart failure, when the ATP and ADP are getting depleted, um, the ADP concentration starts to go down. And, and, and as a consequence, the, a, the phosphate concentration has to go up. And this is not what this talk is about. This is, this is a lot of the work that, that um, Rachel Lopez has been doing in the lab and, and also Bahadur Marsman. Um, we think that the consequence of that um, loss of adenucleotide pools, one of the consequences is in order to achieve respiratory control, inorganic phosphate has to go up. Um, and when inorganic phosphate goes up, that starts to imp impede the cross bridge. Um, and then you start to get um, an, an inability to generate cardiac power, and that contributes to so the energetic failure, contributes to uh, mechanical failure in, in, in the heart. Um, the second question, Costas, I don't know, maybe, maybe you know, maybe we could talk about that, but there's obviously something um, achieving different resting phosphate concentrations in terms of how phosphate is, um, is transported in and out of the cell. Okay, I'm a little behind where I want to be, so I'm going a little fast. But but this was remember this is this is this is Jason's motto of of oxfos. Okay, um, we're interested in getting at at the TCA cycle, other bits of the TCA cycle. So we've started doing. Well, this is this is a what I'm showing here is is a very typical kind of mitochondrial experiment for for mitochondrial people. Um, I'm showing an experiment where uh, on on the on the top I'm giving you measurements of NADH on the bottom, I'm giving you oxygen flux. And then um, the typical experiment that, that we and others do is we add substrates to our isolated mitochondria and we achieve what's called a leak state. Sometimes it's called state two. So like food, in this case, it's pyruvate and malate is the food. Then we add ADP. And when we add ADP, we get state three. So oxygen flux goes up, NADH goes down. Okay. And then once you've consumed all that ADP, you've, you've phosphorylated it. Okay oxygen flux goes back down and you go into what's called state four, which is another kind of kind of leak state. Um, so this is sort of reminiscent if you're, if you do like seahorse kind of experiments of this sort of time course you might get depending on your, your seahorse protocol of these different states. Um, I'm gonna show this kind of four plots over and over again for, for, for a little bit. On the left is low phosphate. So when we have limiting phosphate, okay, we don't really get a clear state three, state four kind of transition. And we get a much lower oxygen flux because phosphate is limiting. When you've got plenty of phosphate here, two and a half millimolar, we get this kind of thing happening. Okay, this experiment with pyruvate and malate gives us information about the kinetics of these things, this transporter, this transporter, and these enzymes in the system, okay? Um, we've spent a lot of time as a group 
more than a decade, trying to understand and build models for all of these, many of these individual pieces in the TCA cycle. So this is just an example of a bunch of models we tried for malate dehydrogenase. This is a subset of a bunch of huge number of progress curves we collected for the reaction. Um, and then we tried, we, we said, okay, this is, this is something called, if you're an enzymologist, an ordered bye-bye kind of reaction. This is a theoretical chance reaction and all kinds of other sort of catalytic mechanisms. We try out all these different mechanisms. They all have, we, we try to fit all the kinetic constants against the data. And we come up with a model for malate dehydrogenase. We do the same thing for citrate synthase. We do the same thing for conotase. We do the same thing for isocitrate dehydrogenase, on and on and on. Um, we don't necessarily have a good way of doing that for pyruvate dehydrogenase because it's a big, messy enzyme with so many subunits and it's got a phosphorylase, phosphorylase and a kinase attached to it. Um, it's hard to do this kind of process for the transporters because the transporters, um, we need to really work with intact systems to understand how the transporters work. So when we do an experiment like this, we we're getting information on not only the enzymes that we have good models for, but some of the transporters and enzymes for which we don't have good models for, and we try to fit models to the data. So that's what this dashed line is, right? Is a, is a, is a model fit to the data. Okay, so um, here's an, an example of the kind of thing we, we, we did recently. Um, these are experiments from Fran Vandenberg and, and Nicole Collins, where she, they looked at high, high pyruvate and low pyruvate, and you get almost exactly the same thing happening in, in, in both of these conditions. You can't see it, but trust me that with high pyruvate, you get a tiny bit higher flux and a little bit of a faster um, buildup of, of state three. Whoops. Um, but even at 0.5 millimolar pyruvate, which is probably higher than in vivo, you, pyruvate is saturating. So if we want, really want to get at pyruvate dependence on the kinetics, we probably have to go to lower pyruvate. Okay, here's a really interesting experiment. Let's feed the mitochondria succinate instead of pyruvate. And in this case, we get a really strange kind of thing happening. We get a really high NADH, which is expected because when you're feeding a complex two substrate, complex one is really only can go in reverse and you build up a lot of NADH, okay? You have a huge amount of leak. Um, part of the reason for that huge amount of leak is the membrane potential is really high with this high NADH. Part of the reason is because you're not, your, your proton pumping is lower per oxygen. You're only pumping six protons instead of 10. And we also think that with the ROS that's being generated, you're um, opening up some, some um, redox or ROS sensitive uh, potassium channels, which are leading to this higher leak. Then you don't get a state three when you add ADP. You get this big collapse, okay? And the re you get this collapse in NADH and you get, a it's like, oh, I wanna start going to state three and then everything collapses. And the reason it collapses, we think, is because as soon, during state two, you're building up huge amounts of malate. And as soon as you collapse the NADH, this thing can, this malate dehydrogenase can go forward and you get pathologically high amounts of oxaloacetate, which then um, actually inhibit succinate dehydrogenase. And, um, and then eventually you get this recovery things start to work and that's because of this oxaloacetate decarboxylase reaction which i don't want to talk too much about um and we're doing yeah. lots of yeah go ahead yeah, sorry dave lombard and i'm i'm you know you got into the sort of pseudo seahorse part of the talk so i'm i'm keeping up i think um i mean it occurs to me like i mean maybe you should team up with costas to kind of measure these metabolites in the mitochondria <laughs> in your ouroboros i mean i think you know, it'd be very informative to actually see what's going on with the metabolites during these yes. experiments. Yes, yes. Um, what, yeah, I, 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 I agree in, in, entirely. And, and, and we, we measure some of these things using biochemical assays, and I'm not even talking about that. And Edith Lopez has been measuring a lot of the, you know, we have, we have a dilute, this, these experiments I didn't talk about are in a really dilute suspension of mitochondria. So the mitochondria is like, to, to buffer ratio is about a thousand or one to a thousand. And so we can measure the things that are being transported out and the things that are being transported in changes in those things. And so, um, and, and we, we measure these things, not with fancy metabolomics, but right now with mostly with, with sort of um, enzyme linked biochemical assays. And, and, and we can, um, but we, yeah, absolutely. We should talk about trying to join forces a little better. Um, we're doing these experiments with lots of different recipes and, 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 and the goal of all these different recipes is to identify the model, the kinetics of all of these pieces in this picture. And so I have this really fantastic model of everything, right? Um, not everything, but a lot of things. Um, so the details, 
I don't want to talk about because I want to get to one kind of exciting story, and that is Lydia said, "Hey, look at these 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 basil and vinicot experiments where we were getting like 150 in these units um, millimoles of oxygen per minute per unit citrate synthase. In this experiment, we're only getting 80. So there's something wrong here, right? And um, and I said I I wasn't I said well no 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 not necessarily because at this point we're at where we're at the peak flux." We've consumed half of our ADP, so the ADP is lower than it is here, and we've consumed a, a lot of the phosphates. The phosphate is lower, so it should be fine. Um, and as a matter of fact, we said, let's add more ADP. And if we add more ADP, this flux keeps going up and up and up and up. So this is not really a Vmax. But there's this question about why is it going up so slowly? Why doesn't it go to its Vmax right away? What is this process? And so again, you know, the dashed lines are models um, and, and the model can sort of capture what's going on reasonably well. Um, and the way it captures what's going on is it says, oh, there's a very slow activation of this PDH, okay? And the PDH is activated by, um, by um, becoming dephosphorylated and it's controlled by the NADH. And so the idea is during this state too, where the mitochondria is energized, there's, there's plenty of NADH, there's plenty of ATP, there's a lot of acetyl-CoA sitting around, right? And what's happening is you're, you're dephosphorylating the PDH. And so when you start putting a load on the system, you start, um, sorry, you're phosphor phosphorylating the PDH in state two, you start dephosphorylating it, and then your, your PDH activity is climbing, 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 and climbing. So um, that's how the model works. And, and again, that's how the model is able to capture what's going on. And so, we said, okay, in that case, how can we test that hypothesis? So here's a model simulation um, to test that hypothesis. And, I'm, and, and we're doing something different in this model uh, for the red curve than we're doing for the black dashed, dashed line. Can, can anybody see what the difference is? I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just gonna skip ahead. The, the, the difference is we said, if you have, if, 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 if during this very long state two, PDH is becoming phosphorylated, we think it's probably dephosphorylated in state one, that is with no substrate, because there's no ATP. It's hard to phosphorylate things with no ATP. But now you've got ATP being synthesized. Again, you've got lots of NADH. PDH is getting dephosphorylated. If we have a much shorter state three, we should get a much, we get a little bit higher peak, but also a, a, a bigger increase here, right? A, a, a more rapid approach to that peak. Um, so instead of having, so the, the idea was to just have a shorter state three. So um, I just, I like this quote so much. Um, we have a beautiful hypothesis. Um, let's, let's test the hypothesis and see if we wind up with an ugly fact, right? Okay. <laughs> So um, what's the hypothesis? Just to recap, in the model during state two, when the mito is fully energized, the PDH complex is becoming phosphorylated. If we limit the duration of state two, we'll get an elevated state three peak oxygen. Okay, so this was Tuesday afternoon, okay? Um, hot off the press from, from uh, Fran and Nicole. And sure enough, the trend is right, okay? And this is an N equals one, and they did a 30 second versus 130 second state three, and they get this, now, now in, the, in the oxygraph, this difference is absolutely 100% reproducible and quantitative. It looks like a small difference. And of course it's N equals one and we have to repeat it. And the difference isn't as big as what the model says. And there's a few reasons for that. One is the model's wrong, but another potential reason is that maybe we don't have the kinetics of the PDH phosphorylation dephosphorylation cycle, right? And maybe we need an even shorter state two. But um, so, so more to follow on that. Um, but I wanna just, I want to just end with this, this idea. So here we had, a, we had a, a model, which is always models are always wrong. We think of the models as, as a hypothesis, right? And then let me just go back. And we said, okay, the model told us we didn't understand what was happening. Uh, there was something missing. And so then the model, we generated a new hypothesis with the model. So the model doesn't just represent a hypothesis, but it generates a hypothesis. And then it tells us what experiment we need to do to test the model, to test the hypothesis. And then of course we test it and we find out, well, how right is it? How wrong is it? And we move forward in, in that kind of cycle. So we're always, we're always slaying our hypotheses with ugly facts. Here's an example of where the fact wasn't all that ugly. It was kind of, kind of <laughs> encouraging. Um, but I just, you know, I, I, it, it, 
you know, this this guy, if, if you don't know who who Thomas Henry Huxley is, um, you know, I guess in the pantheon of, of, of old dead white guys, you know, he's he's actually somebody who's worth looking at his life. Um, he was poor, um, no education, uh, and became an incredibly important contributor to um, zoology, and, and was known as Darwin's bulldog, one of the one of the big proponents of, of evolution. And um, if you know the name Huxley, he was also the forefather of many of sort of real scientific aristocracy, um, for for good and for bad. Um, anyhow, so uh, that's it. Questions, comments, clarifications, um, arguments. Go for it. Hey, Dan, I have a silly question that clearly these are way ahead, you know, way above my head. Um, but I was wondering, is there any way that, that you could calculate the, or predict the, or, or mod, model the disease state? Um, um, one thing I could, what I could think about is, you know, for for our mitochondria that looks so weird and so gigantic, yeah, is this this is going to be really very very different, right? That the matrix volume, which is probably controls the ATP ADP concentration, or I, you know, the, I was hoping you could comment on that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So so the, the, the short, eight simple answer is yeah, we can and we can model anything, right? If we have data. Oh. Um, and um, and so these experiments are a little tedious, you know, trying to get at all of these sort of details about, um, you know, substrate handling and, and transport and, and oxidation. Um, the furthest we've come in modeling this disease state in terms of energetics is in heart failure energetics. And our models of, of heart failure energetics assume mitochondria are perfectly normal. They're the same as, as the healthy. And as a matter of fact, when we take mitochondria out of failing human hearts, they seem perfectly healthy and they do their job just the same. Um, and um, now that's a very broad thing to say. And of course, there's so many different etiologies and details. Um, but we think that the driving force for the phenotypes we've looked at is not of, of differences in, in, in mitochondrial function is not intrinsic to mitochondria, but has to do with the substrate pools in which they're swimming in, 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 the, in, the, in the myocyte. Um, for your mitochondria, um, it's a different beast, right? I mean, we've, we've looked at um, yeah. brown fat mitochondria. And of course, they don't really have a state three that looks like this because they're not really built to, to make ATP so much, right? Yeah, exactly. um, and so, but in principle, we can, we can absolutely start to tease out these differences by doing these, these kinds of experiments side by side and in, in healthy versus, you know, or control versus disease. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank yeah. you. Dan, I have a question. Um, it, it's sort of a technical question. Um, for a long time, I've been interested in mitochondrial membrane potential, and I made some qualitative measurements of it years ago. I know that you can you can calculate it theoretically uh, under a number of different conditions, but how reliably can one measure mitochondrial membrane potential, and what do you think of yeah. experimental measurements of it? Yeah. So our measures of it, um, the the it are, are done using this this um, reporter called TPP, which sure. is a, right. And I don't remember what it stands for. Tetra, blah blah blah. Um, and and that is those those measurements are super reliable because we can calibrate them. We know about the partitioning of the of the reporter in the membrane from calibration, and then we we know how it gets partitioned in and out based on sort of a Nernst kind of calculation. Um, the problem with TPP is. Um, we, we can't use, um, you know, TPP interferes with sodium, um, sodium calcium exchanger. So we can't use calcium. So only under certain conditions can we actually get those, me those TPP measurements. Um, uh -huh. there are lots of dyes to know about, right? Mm -hmm. And if we calibrate those dyes against something like TPP, then in principle, we should be able to get, um, you know, quantitative measurements of mitochondria using mitochondrial membrane potential using dyes, right? Um, but that's, you know, really tedious and tricky and you gotta, you, you know, you gotta do it right. And I'm not sure how much it's, how, if it's, if it's been done. Right? And what do you, and what do you think that measurements of mitochondrial membrane potential, um, what do you think about their ability to predict ATP levels or the ATP ADP ratio? 
as people yeah. have tried to do. Yeah. Well, that's what we 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 did. I did right at the, mm -hmm. at the beginning of these calculations, and you know, you get pretty reasonable numbers, and um, you know, for the for the you know, the missing piece is what is the delta pH in vivo. Um, and of course, the other missing piece is how close is this whole system really to equilibrium? We think the F1, F0 ATPase in our models, um, it the models predict that that's really close to equilibrium and it's the, that tra that ANT transporter, which is much more kinetically limited. Um, and uh, so I, I think it, I don't think there's one broad answer to that question. It depends on the tissue type. You yeah. can certain muscle, you can make measurements much better than you can in the myocardium. The problem in vivo with something like MRI spectroscopy, right? The problem with that is your skeletal muscle is made up of lots of different fiber types. Yeah, sure. And, and so what are you really getting when you're, when you're integrating? The heart is a lot more homogeneous in terms of fiber type, but it's really, you know, I, what's coming online are these seven Tesla scanners. And, um, and, and there are some still not really quantitative measurements of that inorganic phosphate signal, but um, at least getting detected um, under resting conditions. And, and the other thing is that phosphate signal, th there's been reports of two peaks in phosphate. And so what do two phosphate peaks mean to, and I'm not an expert in phosphate spectroscopy, but that means two different pH pools, which means mm. you can then start to estimate what is that delta pH in, in, in um, actually in vivo. So I think this stuff is coming online with, with better technology, but then in a beta cell, for example, it's a much different story, I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you. I just have like a really fast question, Dan. Why is it, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, because I'm on my iPhone. Um, I'm Zoe online. Um, why is it that in the past, like in the 1980s, they were not able to see the inorganic phosphate, you know, becoming measurable, you know, when the heart is working hard? Do they just not have the equipment that, is it still not high enough that they could have noticed it with their technology at the time? Yeah. So the, the the big problem, I I I think this 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 there's a sort of a, a lot of different opinions on 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 what was going on. One of the real difficulties in measuring phosphate in a heart, it's not just that it's a lower concentration, but what is the heart full of? The heart is full of blood, and 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 there's a there's a signal in the in the phosphate spectra from two three dpg, which is a ton of in the blood, which sits right on top of inorganic phosphate. And so it's not just, and, and of course, the heart is moving. So when you're doing, when you're trying to get, um, you know, a localized signal, um, you know, you have a moving free wall, say of the left ventricle, you have this giant pool of blood, which is giving you this interfering signal, which has to be subtracted away. And of course, in the 80s, this technology was brand new and the, the magnet field strengths were much lower and field strength, it, it, it is one of the determinants of signal to noise ratio. Um, so, um, so that's, that's weird that they didn't know, see they, they were bad experimenters though, because they should have realized, you know, the limitations uh, of their equipment and been like, Hey, if it's up, but not by like a zillion, we will not detect it before making a bold claim. Like it's not going up, especially since it contradicts what you see in the skeletal muscle. Well, right. And that, I mean, that particular measurement, you know, I mean, it, these experiments were repeated right over, over the decades since, and 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 that particular measurement has not been replicated um, ab, 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 about the phosphate. So, um, you know, that's that's just that's just how, how science works. Unfortunately, I think that I think the thinking was set back because you know, once once something kind of gets set in stone, it's hard to um, it's hard to rethink it sometimes um, and, and and revise the thinking. Especially if the guy was elite who said it. Thank you. Great talk, Dan. Just a quick question. Um, any idea how this compares with mitochondrial function in the brain? And I, I know the brain has many different parts itself, but. Yeah. Um, okay, that's, I can, the easy answer there is no, no idea. Um, so so the, <laughs> the brain is so tough because, um, you know, brain, first of all, if you, if, you know, brain has so many different cell types, right? And, and they're communicating with one another. 
and they're metabolically communicating with one another. So, so um, it's not as if the, the astrocytes and the glial cells are, are all, you know, one, uh, you know, a, a, a byproduct of one is, a, is, a, is an input substrate for the other. So um, we've stayed away from the brain. Thank you. <laughs> I, I will say the brain, there's two organs, maybe three, but really two organs that consume a ton of oxygen, right? And especially in humans, we've got this big, ridiculously big, heavy brain, right? That is, you know, gets in the way of, you know, you know, it probably impedes our, our, our ability to exercise quite a bit, right? Compared to many other mammals. And um, it's just, it's just consuming oxygen, you know, it's so expensive. Um, the heart consumes a lot of oxygen, but of course the heart is, from the cardiovascular perspective, it's doing something very important, right? And the heart is loaded with mitochondria. The brain is loaded with mitochondria. The third organ that's really um, has a ton of mitochondria is the kidney, and it's it's only part of the kidney. It's I think it's the outer medulla which is doing all that pumping. And mitochondrial densities in the in the um, outer medulla, um, maybe it's the inner medulla, but it's where all the all the sodium pumps are. Um, are approaching the, the kind of density that you have in the heart. The heart is about a third mitochondria. Yeah. It's probably the proximal tubules in the kidney, I would think. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. All right. Well, good. This was fun. I got, I, there's, there's another chat. See if there's anything. No more questions, uh, just comments. Anyhow. Yeah, thanks, guys.